This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome to Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics and Applications 2. Today we're going to continue talking about context-free grammars. And we're going to begin with a, a problem. Uh, the problem is, let's look at this language here, which is, which is the set of all strings, non-empty strings of A and B, such that the number of A's in the string equals the number of B's in the string. So we would like to find a context-free grammar that generates this language. And that will show, of course, that this language is context-free. Okay, so our um, grammar is going to have a set of non-terminals. It's going to have two terminals, A and B, a set of productions, and we're going to have a start state, which we'll call S. And so what should N and P be? Well, here are the productions that will be in P. Um, S goes to a, B, or S goes to B, A. Obviously, there's two choices here. Our string starts with A, or it starts with B. Now, this non-terminal B, its purpose is to make sure that we owe, we owe, a, owe a B. So whatever string it produces, it has to have a B to match this A. Same way with the non-terminal A. It basically says we owe an owe a, a. We have to have an A that will match this B, so that the number of A's and B's is always equal. And so uh, A can go, capital A can go to little a, capital A goes, because this will be the A that's owed to match the B, and capital A will go to AS, this will be the A that will match the B, and then uh, S presumably will have the same number of A's and B's. And if a capital A goes to B, then we have to follow by two capital A's, where these two capital A's will match this B and the previous B that needs to be matched. And the non-terminal B is symmetric. And so the number of non-terminals or set of non-terminals is S A and B. Okay, so um, what we want to do is define three predicates. The first is P sub S of X. This predicate is true precisely if we can derive X from S, if and only if the number of A's in X and number of B's in X equal. So if the number of A's in X and number of B's in X are equal, we can derive it. If they're not equal, we cannot derive it from S. And so P sub A of X, um, it states that we can drive x from a if and only if the number of a's in x is one more than the number of b's. And finally, p sub b of x is true if and only if we can derive x from b if and only if the number of b's is one more than the number of a's. Okay, so the theorem we really want to prove here is that for all non-empty strings of a and a's and b's, p of s of x holds. And P of X of S hold says that we can uh, drive X from S and the number of, of A's and X and the number of B's and X would be equal. So this is a theorem one. Theorem one. And if we just try proving this by induction on the length of X, our proof will fail. It will fail because in the induction hypothesis, we won't be able to get things to go through because our induction hypothesis won't be strong enough. We won't have enough information to make the proof go through. But if we could prove theorem 1, then we immediately get corollary 3, which says the language of our grammar equals the, this language, the language of all non-empty strings of A's and B's. They have the same number of A's and the same number of B's. So we need to prove theorem 1. If we can prove it, we're done. We've solved the problem. So the way we're going to prove theorem 1 is we're going to prove a lemma 1. And a lemma 1 is going to be for all non-empty strings of x's and 1's, p of s of x holds, and p of a of x holds, and p of b of x holds. And notice now we have this part, which is missing here. 
So lemma one is a stronger theorem than, than theorem one. And we're going to be able to prove this by weak induction and the length of x. And obviously, if we can prove theorem one, then that gives us an immediately proof, immediate proof of theorem. Excuse me, if we can prove lemma one, we will immediately get theorem one because theorem one is weaker. Theorem one just says that this is true, while uh, lemma one says all three are true. Okay. So let me ask you a quick question. Do you understand the need for strengthening the induction hypothesis to prove that the language of G equals the, the set of all non-empty strings of A's and B's that have the same number of A's, the same number of B's? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Well, I'm just going to repeat. I, I don't know if you chose yes or no. I don't know if you understood this need, but there is a need. Our proof will not work unless we have a stronger induction hypothesis. In other words, we need to know these three facts, not just the first fact. We're only interested in the first fact for the theorem, but we, need, we are interested in all three facts for the lemma, which gets us to the theorem. Okay, so let's prove lemma one. Uh, I'm going to start by defining a property n, a property of natural numbers, which says for all strings of length n formed from a and b, those strings satisfy p of s, p of a, and p of b. And you can see that lemma 1 is equivalent to this lemma 2, which says for all natural numbers greater than or equal to 1, p of n holds. So uh, lemma 2 is just another way of stating lemma 1. Lemma 1 was stated in terms of the strings. Lemma 2 is stated in terms of strings of length n. And we will prove lemma 2 by weak induction. OK, uh, so we're going to start with the base case, n equals 1. And we have to prove that the property, this property here, we have to prove it holds for 1. OK, and there's two cases. Since our string is of length 1, our string can either be an a or it can be a B. Uh, now if it's an A, um, then notice that um, uh, if it's an A, we're going to have to show P of A, P of S of A holds, P of A of A holds, and P of B of A holds. Now P of S of A and P of A, B of A hold, since we can't derive A from S or B. Let's just go back and look at our productions. There's no way we can drive just the terminal A from S. There's no way we can drive from B. This is the only way we can do it. This is the only rule that will get us to just do it. So, so that means that P of A, S of A, and P of B of hold, since A is not derivable at all, they, another way of saying they, these vacuously hold, P of A of A holds. Since um, we can derive um, A this way, and this, the number of A's in here is one more than the number of B's. The number of A's is one, the number of B's is zero. Um, so that means P of A of A holds. Now, the case when we have B is completely symmetric, basically, just replace, uh, well, it's symmetric. The argument's very similar. OK, so let's go to the induction step. Uh, so now we're going to assume n is greater than or equal to 1. And we're going to assume property, the property holds at n. And we must show that the property holds at n plus 1. So we're dealing with a string of length n plus 1. There's two forms this string can have. It can start with an a. It can start with a b, and what's left should have length n, because this string is going to be of length n plus 1. OK, so uh, we have to show that p of s of x holds, p of a of x holds, and p b of x holds. And it's going to turn out that these proofs are all similar. So we're just going to show that p of s of x holds. Now, um, if we go back to p of s of x holds, 
That's here. Here's what, if you think of what we have to prove, you can think of this as A and B. We got to prove A implies B. And we got to prove B implies A. And that's exactly what we're, we're going to do uh, here. We're going to start A implies B here, and later we're going to do B implies A. Okay, so uh, let's do A implies B. So here's A. We're going to assume this. We can derive X from S. And now what we need to show is B. B is says that the number of A's in X and the number of B's in X are equal. So if we can derive X from S, that means, since this string starts with an A, we're going to be able to derive a string of this form. Because that's the only production rule that's going to work. We can derive this in one step. And then the rest of the proof will go from driving Y from B. But just, just make sure you're convinced uh, if we're starting off and we need the first thing to be A, this is the only rule that works. And that's the rule we're going to be using. The only production rule will, rule will work. Okay, so, so that means the proof ends with this. And the length of this derivation is N. So by the induction hypothesis, because we're starting with B, we know that the number of B's and Y's is one more than the number of A's. So B has exactly one more uh, B than the number of A's. And so uh, that means that the number of A's in B and the number of B's in B will be equal because we have another A here. Okay, so, so we're able to show this. That completes that direction. The other direction is we start by assuming our string has the same number of A's and B's. Uh, then the number of B's and Y, because there's an A here, will be one more than the number of Y's. So by the induction hypothesis, we can derive Y from B. And therefore, our proof will go by the S goes to AB, and uh, the B goes to Y. Therefore, AB goes to AY, and AY is the X that we're going to show. And so then, as I said before, uh, these two cases are similar. This other case, when x begins with b, is completely symmetric with the case uh, that x begins with a. So that basically completes the proof of lemma 1. Notice that there's a lot of parts to this, but many of these parts are similar to each other. We had basically only two different things we had to prove, different arguments. These were the two, and we proved those. The other ones are similar to these two arguments. Okay, now we're going to go to a different example. This is an example of balance parentheses. Now we're going to represent the parentheses using square brackets. So um, a string of parentheses is, is, uh, can be balanced or unbalanced, and we're going to look at a language called paren, it's the set of all strings of parentheses that are balanced. And remember, balance are strings that look like this. And they're not strings that look like this. Or like this. Okay, now we want to come up with a grammar that generates this language. And the grammar is going to have a start symbol a start non-terminal. It's going to have left and right parentheses and a bunch of productions. And these productions are going to be just three kinds. S goes to left parenthesis, S right parenthesis, or it goes to SS, or goes to the empty string. Only three productions here. And so we have to prove, we're going to prove that the language of generated by this grammar is this language paren, this language of balance parentheses. Now, the first thing we have to do is really formalize what it means for parentheses to be balanced. So we're going to say one of these strings of parentheses is balanced. If it satisfies two properties, b1 and b2, b1 
D1 is a simple property. It says the number of, of um, left parentheses equals the number of right parentheses. That's what L and R mean here. That's obvious. And, uh, but, but that's not enough because here, if you look here, the number of left parentheses and right parentheses are the same. But we need another property that says for all prefixes. So a prefix is the beginning of a string, the beginning of the x string. All prefixes of x, the number of left parentheses in that prefix is greater than or equal to the number of right parentheses. So if you look here, and if we look at a prefix, like we take this part, you can see we have one, two, three lefts and one right. Three is greater than or equal to that one right. So this is the, this is the other property D, property B2. And so what we're going to prove is that our language equals the set of all strings that satisfy B1 and B2. All say strings of parentheses that satisfy B1 and B2. Okay, so the way we're going to prove this, well, well um, we're going to prove it in two parts. Um, let me put it like this. We're going to prove this part, that if we can derive alpha from S, then that means alpha satisfies B1 and B2. We're going to start by proving that. And the second part is going to be the converse. And that is, we're going to show that B implies A. And therefore, if we prove both of those, that's lemma 3 and lemma 4, we'll know A is true if and only if B, and that's really what we want, want to prove. We want to prove, we go back up here, we want to prove that the language of G is going to be exactly the set of all strings that satisfies B1 and B2. Okay, so we're going to prove this. And we're going to prove it by weak induction on the length of the derivation. So we have some derivation, alpha, it's going to be a certain number of steps. We're going to prove this lemma by weak induction on length of the derivation of alpha. So this is, this is a different proof by induction than the previous one. Be The previous one was, a, was on the length of the string we're deriving. Here we're going to do induction, weak induction actually, on the length of the derivation of alpha. So the base case is, the length is zero, that means that uh, s goes to s, that means alpha must be s, and alpha has no parentheses, so it satisfies b1 and b2 trivially. Okay, so the induction step is that s goes to alpha in n steps, so we can break that down as s goes to beta in n steps, and then from beta to alpha we go in one step. And then by the induction hypothesis, because we have a derivation of length n. So our induction hypothesis, we prove, we're assuming that our lemma holds for, induct, for uh, derivations of length n. That means beta satisfies b1 and b2. So that's our induction hypothesis. So, so now from beta, we have to get to alpha. There's three ways of doing it because there's only three kinds of productions. So we have three cases. Uh, S goes to SS, S goes to Epsilon, and S goes to left parenthesis, S right parenthesis. Okay, so in these cases, you can see that we do not introduce any new parentheses. The number of parentheses do not change. So if beta was satisfying B1 and B2, then alpha will also be satisfying B1 and B2. So, so these are easy. Case 1 and case 2 are easy. Um, so case three is the more interesting case. That is, we're going from S to left parenthesis, S right parenthesis. So here we're introducing parentheses. In fact, we're introducing two of them. And um, so that means beta is going to be beta one, S beta two, because we're going to be working on S. And so then alpha will be beta one, left parenthesis, s, right parenthesis, beta 2, because we're using this production. 
So this will be beta, beta, and this is alpha. And so if we look at the number of left parentheses, um, that will equal the number of left, left parentheses of alpha will equal the number of left parentheses of beta plus one, which equals the number of right parentheses of beta plus one. Now this, this is true because this follows by the induction hypothesis. Beta satisfies B1 and B2, in particular satisfies B1. And the number of right parentheses of beta plus one will obviously equal uh, the number of right parentheses of alpha. We, we can just count them. The number of right parentheses here will be whatever the number of, of they are in beta, and here will be the number they are in beta plus one. Okay, so alpha satisfies B1. Now, um, let gamma be a prefix of alpha. Um, so we need to show that the number of left parentheses of gamma is greater than or equal to the number of right parentheses of gamma, so that alpha satisfies B2. So there's three cases. The cases are, let me uh, clean this up a little. The cases are that we have a substring of alpha that does not include either parenthesis. We have a substring of alpha that includes the first parenthesis, and we have a substring of alpha that includes both parentheses. That's what these three cases are. Uh, so the first one is gamma is a, going to be a prefix, but it's a prefix of beta 1, but not a prefix of the whole of, of um, wait, it's a prefix of, of beta 1, just beta 1. Uh, and so it satisfies B2 by the induction hypothesis because it's also a prefix of beta. And we know beta satisfies B2. So we're done with that case. Case two is gamma is a prefix of beta 1 left parenthesis S. In other words, it's a prefix of alpha that includes one parenthesis. Um, and then we know that um, uh, by the induction hypothesis, the number of parentheses of B1 is going to be greater or equal to the number of parentheses of, I should say, beta 1 is the number, is greater or equal to the number of parentheses of beta 2. Um, by the induction hypothesis. Um, excuse me, I didn't say that right. The number of left parentheses of beta 1 is going to be greater than or equal to the number of right parentheses of beta 1 by the induction hypothesis. So this is going to equal this because we have just one more um, here, which is going to equal, be greater than or equal uh, to this, and that's going to be greater than this because we don't have this. Okay, so that gets us Kate, the second case. The third case is gamma includes both, and by the induction hypothesis, uh, we will know this is true. Um, we know this is true because beta satisfies property B2, and Therefore, the number of left parentheses of gamma will equal this plus 1, which is greater than this plus 1, which equals that. Okay, so that means uh, alpha satisfies uh, B2. Uh, that uh, concludes our proof of lemma 3. Let me remind you, lemma 3 is showing that this implies this. And then lemma four is the converse, B implies A. This is, the proof is, of this is done by strong induction and length of X. So the previous lemma was by weak induction on the length of the derivation. Here it's strong induction on the length of the string. And I'm not gonna give a proof now, but you can find a proof in, in pages 138 to 9 of Dexter Cozen's book, Automata and Computing. So lemma 3 and 4 together, they give us theorem 2 is what we want. 
the, the language of our grammar, G, is the set of all strings of parentheses that satisfy B1 or 2, B1 and B2, which are the same as saying all balanced strings of parentheses. Okay, uh, that will complete it, what we're going to do for today. Next time we're going to talk about uh, various kinds of grammars. Thank you very much. We will stop here.